London, listen up. We will be with you taking our checklist-based trading strategies on the back of the CC Forum, October 12 at the Queen Elizabeth Conference Center. If you want to learn these checklist-based trading strategies that I've been employing for quite some time and you want to learn it in person, get yourself booked now. We have thousands of people at the CC Forum and the event will sell out quickly. From there, we move on to Malta on the 9th of November. That'll be at the Intercontinental Hotel in Malta, also backing on to the back of an event, which is Malta AI and Blockchain Summit. Again, thousands of people expected, so get your spot quickly from Malta straight across the pond to Singapore. November 16 at Marina Bay Sands, another event we are tacking on to the end of, which is called Block Show. Again, this has got thousands of people, so if you wanna come along, get in there quick. And finally, back in Sydney on the 23rd and 24th, at the Ridges World Square. So guys, whether it be London, Malta, Singapore, you need to get yourself along to these events if you want to learn the checklist-based trading that I employ and use daily. Very simple stuff, guys. Go to tradercob.com forward slash global and book your spot right now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Trader Cob Crypto Show. Today's guest, I know I've said this before, guys, but I'm so fortunate. I get to meet some of the best brains in the space. I'm really looking forward to this one. And the reason I'm looking forward to it is it's multifaceted. This man has been in business for a long time, been in technology for a long time, knows families all over the world, family offices, that is. He's all over the shop as far as, that sounds really messy, but he's smart. He's switched on. I've got a lot of great questions from him. It's Nick Ayton, who let me just rattle off some of the things here. He is the CEO at Chain Starter. He's the executive producer and story creator at 21 Million TV. He's also CEO at Quantum Jump Cryogenic Computing. I mean, if your head's not already blown, stick around. We're going to get to the bottom of what this actually means. Nick, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, mate. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Yeah, looking forward to it. Mate, first question, what are the names of the kittens in the background? Uh, Bubba, who's got a little uh, bit of, uh, it looks like uh, Adolf Hitler. He's got a little Hitler moustache, actually. And, uh, and B. So, uh, Bubba and B. Was, was Bubba the one in prison first? Yeah, yeah, he's, a, he's an <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> All right, Nick, look, first of all, as I always do, mate, let, let's start with your background, buddy. I mean, where, where have you come from? I know you've been around for quite some time in, this, in, uh, in technology. You want to tell us a little bit about sort of what you've done in the past and, and, you know, what brought you into, I suppose, this amazing space that's blockchain and AI? It's, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I've been in computer science since the 70s. Um, so I was coding in 75, 76. I wasn't very good at it, by the way, because the languages in those days were dreadful, Fortran and Pascal. But what, what, um, what I learned in the 70s, that the technology hasn't really changed. The laws of computer science, the laws of physics are pretty much fixed. Well, until quantum, that is, of course. Um, but, you know, it's pretty predictable. So I, I've had, what, 12, 14 startups, I think. Um, I've had a few, couple of successful exits. It's tough out there still. And in the 80s, 90s, I went into technology outsourcing. So I worked for some of the big guns, you know, some of the big firms and worked for some of the big, big uh, technology companies, you know, the big outsourcing firms like Computer Sciences and CSC and, and so on. And then, um, and then I went into turnarounds, um, a lot of consulting turnarounds, a lot of big tech turnarounds. But at the heart of it, I've always, I've always had business. So I've built platforms for insurance, for pensions. Um, and, then, and then in 2012, decentralized computing had been discussed since the 70s. Yeah. It's not a new concept. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I bumped into you know, Bitcoin in 2012. Like everybody, didn't buy enough at the right price. And then, and then got hooked. I suddenly thought, well, you've solved double spend, which is the thing that David Charm with DigiCash couldn't, couldn't solve at the time. And, and of course I thought, well, this technology is gonna take off. And uh, I see it as a technology more than a, you know, a money-making machine actually. So, so that's it. So let me ask you this, okay? Nick, you have obviously done very well in your career. You, you, you just rattle off, you had 14 startups, of course. Uh, you don't need all 14 to work out. You know, you just need a couple that, uh, that hit the nail on the head. Yeah, indeed, yeah. You've worked with big firms, you've consulted, you've, you've set up pension, like, Create, created things within insurance and pension funds. Now, those are big, big, big industries. Um, you've obviously done very, very well, and obviously you got involved in the Bitcoin, in Bitcoin in the very early days. Why are you still doing stuff? Why, why aren't you just off somewhere, you know, traveling to Monaco and jumping on a yacht? And What, what, what drives you, mate? Like, why, why are you still going? Well, I, I do that as well. I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, it's, I watch, I watch my father work. Um, my father's gone now, but I mean, he, he, uh, he, uh, I watched him have the same job for 35, 40 years. I saw him retire. 
and then within 18 months he became a vegetable really as, as the you lose your brain um i'm 60 in january yeah exactly i'm 60 in january i try and keep myself fit um and unless i've got a challenge i, I just i i love the beach i love doing you know hanging out but after three or four days i get bored yeah. i have a low boredom threshold um so i have to find the next thing um i'm also writing a couple of books which cool. you know were work in progress for some time because i, I you wonder whether you're ever going to finish them, but it's really to keep the brain going. You know, you know that that's that's the motivation, Craig. It's it's not the cash. It's the yeah, it's the brain. And also working with your family is a privilege. It's a pain in the ass sometimes, but it's also uh, it's also a privilege. Oh, absolutely, mate. Don't get me wrong. I watch my father do very similar things. He's still with us. He's just retired. But ladies and gentlemen, I want you to take something away from what Nick just said. For those of you who keep coming to me and saying, "If you're such a good trader, why are you running this business and other businesses?" It's because I want to. I love doing this stuff. I, I, I work a lot more hours now than I used to do full-time trading. But you know what? I bloody love it. I really enjoy yeah. what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm, I'm stimulating a different part of my brain. The trading stuff for me, it's really boring. Uh, look, don't get me wrong. I still love having a good win or I love taking a good trade. Or when you see something form and you set the whole thing out and you plan it out for days on end. And then it sets up. I, I get off on that. But I really am enjoying being involved doing this sort of stuff. So I totally understand where you're coming from. I just wanted to hear your perspective no 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 it makes sense let's talk about 21 million tv i want to know yeah. about that because that sounds really fascinating mate you want to just go in a bit of detail then yeah so um back in february 2017 at the sort of like the just before the peak of the ico madness mm. um i'd all i'd always wanted to make uh i love television so i do a fair bit of corporate tv you know front of camera cnbc stuff and what have you and i quite like the process i'm quite creative so I uh, had the, an idea with a, with a business partner at the time um, to, to make a crypto funded uh, film. Um, and um, we did an ICO. We raised enough capital to make a trailer, a trailer pilot, which is actually now in post-production. And um, it's a long journey. I didn't, uh, I didn't see eye to eye with this uh, partner. So uh, we parted company. And I rewrote the series um, as a season one because the studios like seasons. That's uh, the nature of binge watching these days, I guess. And um, so I've written the season, which follows um, uh, a young team of geeks that make a, a discovery, which basically advances computer science 30 years in one single leap. And it's around quantum, basically, quantum keys. And, um, and then the season goes on set against the existential threat of AI and the race for AI supremacy between the US and China. So it gets a bit... Lots of blood, lots of guns. I like guns, and uh, it's it's quite a, a dark thriller. We shot the pilot in Shoreditch, which is sort of a trendy, engy part of town, as you know. Um, and then we'll we'll play with the series. So so we're looking at um, cinematic release. I'm aiming for end of November. So it's in the cutting room at the moment. We're adding, you know, the color treatments and the music to it. So so it's a a short film as a pilot episode funded by crypto and it's a first um wow. and you know a lot of doubters out there said nick you know you're another one of these ico scammers you haven't delivered anything but two years on we're there and it's making tv content is like building software you need a story which is a script and then you know the story is your requirements and then you build an mvp which we've done and then you get it to market so that's the parallel so it's a, it's a lot of fun so it's basically Silicon Valley meets The Walking Dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could look at it that way. I mean, you know, basically, it's it, the story is around something called a basilisk, and basilisk is a concept that just by knowing puts you in danger. So you know, it's a young bunch of geeky guys, they're very innocent, naive, thrust onto a global stage where all these sort of agencies and governments want what they have because it's all about advancing computer science. I've played Bitcoin and into it a bit and other currencies and stuff like that. But generally it's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tech thriller funded by crypto. That's the key I'm thing. Fascinated. I want to see it. I want to see it now. I want to see it yesterday. It sounds like something I'm very interested in and I congratulate you on getting it as far as you have. And I hope you have nothing but success because it's a, it's artistic B it incorporates some of the new technologies going forward and um you know just just pat in the back like it seems like you just have a crack and when you have a crack you come out on top so I, I yeah i mean it's 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 
it's one of these things, isn't it? I mean, you know, writing software code and, and writing business plans and designing blockchains is one level. But I'd say the toughest thing is writing dialogue. Uh, that is just, I, whoever writes this stuff for the, for the Netflix stuff, full, fully a pretty, it's tough to write, I tell you. So it comes across as natural, very hard. So, uh, so yeah, it's all good fun. Another string in the uh, in the bow, mate. Um, now let me go, while we're on this whole topic around the movie and quantum computing and AI and whatnot, what is the threat of AI? Because I think most people that are, are aware of AI will have heard, um, I think Joe Rogan did something with, with Elon Musk. Elon Musk has been very vocal about having yeah. questions around AI and limiting its ability to a certain point. Now, is this a real threat? I mean, I, I, I respect Elon Musk for many things. Uh, other yeah. things like, uh, um, the, like, I think he's a genius, obviously. He's a modern day genius. He, he really is. He takes big risks. He, he, he walks the way that he wishes to walk. And um, the poor bugger, I just wish he knew how to take a break every now and again, because it sounds like he works himself into the ground and all sorts of issues. But what is the actual threat? of AI if we just let it go wild and you know let it like a fire just just take hold and do what it wants yeah well that's that's a really interesting question I mean and a lot, a lot of a lot of people ask me that and for me we've already passed singularity okay uh, and I'll have I'll debate this ad nauseum with with various professors and stuff but you know so artificial intelligence well there's two there's two there's two planes of problems here the first thing is is the rate of learning is exponentially increasing. So if you look at the AlphaGo situation, you know, when it learned to play the game Go, 19 square sort of board, literally billions of moves, it learned that in a few months and then, you know, built the world, beat the world champion. And then AlphaZero beat, it to, beat that machine 100 to 1 within a couple of months and never did anything, never saw a live game, just learned the rules. So it, the problem with AI is exponentially increasing learning. Now, as carbon-based silicon tops out in terms of Moore's law, um, and you introduce things like quantum computing, which is massively parallel computing, it means that AI for the first time, if it finds quantum, it will find a path to quantum supremacy or super intelligence. Super intelligence is the thing that Musk worried about. At the moment, AI is very narrow. You teach it to play chess. You teach it to drive a car, very narrow. Artificial general intelligence is like IBM Watson. It has a greater, wider spectrum of, of understanding of things, and it starts cross-referencing for itself, and it starts thinking for itself. But there's always an objective or a question that's being solved. So there's always an objective. But then when you get to superintelligence, you're, you're touching on the realms of AI ethics, AI consciousness, where this uh, superintelligence can start to think for itself. Mm. And, and ethically, you know, if mankind is in the way, is the problem. It's Nick Bostrom is a famous Oxford professor who wrote a great book. And um, you, should get, you should have an interview with Nick. He's really interesting. Uh, and he, the, the paperclip example, if you give the AI machine the, the objective to make paperclips, no matter what, from this world, and mankind is in the way, then that's the end of mankind. And, and, it's, and, and, the, and the ethics and the, and the problems with AI being a threat is you give AI objective and it will meet that objective no matter what. And, and that's the problem. Right. So it's, it's yeah. logically driven uh, yeah. learning optimization of the best possible solution. to AI doesn't hate us. It, AI won't hate us unless somebody programs us. And this is really the, the subplot in the TV show, really, is you're not going to, AI is not going to manifest as a Terminator machine. The AI is going to infiltrate us and do things to us. We've got a very fragile society as it is, a very fragile infrastructure. And the AI will work out the best ways to make life hard for us. And, and if mankind is in the way of the objective, that's the danger. And that's why Musk and Bill Gates and others are generally concerned. And the ethics and the consciousness argument, I think, is a, is a misleading one because, you know, the AI, so Google announced a few months ago that it had spawned an AI progeny. Mm -hmm. So the AI engine had created its own AI with its own language that they couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't understand it, how do you know if they deployed code? Mm -hmm. there, there is the singularity effect now, Craig, that I think we've passed. If the engineers, the smartest people don't know, then that's not good, well, personally. Yeah. And, I mean, at the end of the day, computers uh, need power. Uh, Human beings are the biggest 
source of using that power. So it would seem to make sense to go, well, the humans are in the way because they're using all of our power. We need more power. Bye-bye humans, however they can sort of thing. And that's a very wild way of thinking, but that's the sort of way that, that's the logical pathway that could be taken. Yeah, yeah. They divert power from our homes, our businesses yeah. to what they need. Yeah, exactly. And without, I mean, you think about it, you turn on your tap, there's usually electricity that's, that's driving that. Without electricity, we got we're water for four days. Are you kidding me? We're all going to be, you know, bashing each other over the back of the head. With there you got it. Energy. So, so we're getting into the realms of the season one now. So oh, there you go. So I, I, I love it. I love it. I love it. Now let's jump ahead of this season. Let's jump ahead of the AI. But let's stay with quantum computing because I, yeah. I, I'm really interested. I've got to look down right now because I can't remember how to say this without looking down at my notes. Quantum <laughs> jump cryogenic computing. What the hell is that? Well. I mean, quantum computing is um, quantum theory, quantum mechanics has been around since the turn of the century, actually. And um, really, we, if you think about the most uh, crucial invention of mankind, it was actually the telescope. And it allowed us to look out to the stars, you know, five, six hundred years ago and, and find our place in the universe. But then they focused it internally and you created the micron scale scope where we could look down to particle level to actually try and understand how the world really works, how life works and how you thread things together. So what tends to happen is, you know, when you were at school, Craig, you, when you're doing maths, you were, you were looking at factorizing numbers. So if I, if I said, what's the factor of 15, you'd go, Nick, it's, it's three and five. And so, so, but if I gave you, um, SRA encryption, which is based on a 617 character string. If I asked you to take to find the factor with the world's most powerful computers, it would take about 10 million years. Wow. So, and that's the only thing that defends us from encryption is having these enormously long strings of numbers. It's the same as a Bitcoin signature or a, mm. or a hashed address. You know, they're working on the basis of very long strings of numbers that conventional computers can't crack because they don't have enough firepower. Roll forward to quantum computing, which is, think of it as massively parallel computing, where it uses um, particle level, so electrons, photons, very, very small particles, and it can put them in different states that generate a one and a zero, or a one and a zero at the same time. So we're not like binary, which is ones and zeros, to make your code. This can e evolve in lots of different states at the same time, and they entangle all these particles together to, to solve these big problems. Now, the magic happens at very cold temperatures. This is where the cryogenic piece comes in. And you have the Kelvin scale, which is minus 439, I think it is, degrees, which is deep space temperatures, very cold. And that's what you use around quantum computings. And the very cold temperatures slow the photons and the electrons down so you can influence them. And, and really, that's the essence of quantum computing. And that's why you get these amazing brass-looking machines. And that is a machine with all the casing taken off. Once you put the casing back on, it's all about pump. You hear all this compression and pumps and all this pistons going. And that's really vacuum pumps trying to keep the quantum chip, which is tiny, cold. And then they can influence the photon. So that's a real very short thing about quantum computing and, and, and how it works. But it's game changer, Greg. Massive game changer. Anyway, like talk, talk to me, talk to me about what, what I mean, what you just said is it's, you know, intellectually advanced well beyond my understanding as a humble trader, but what, what does it mean to us? So does it mean things are faster, more efficient? Like what does it mean to our everyday life? I suppose, what does it mean to business? Who does it mean the most to? Well, that's that again, there's a lot in that question, but let's unpick a few examples. So, you know, again, when you're in biology at school, there was the concept of photosynthesis. Yes. You know, light hits a leaf and the leaf, you know, the plant is able to turn that into energy. Now, the problem with that is that's what we think happens. We don't know how it actually happens because the chemical equation and the, and the, the activity going on there is ju it's just too big. These compounds and calculations are too big. So, so one of the things we have with quantum is it will allow us to see the world as it really is, not as we think it is. And the problem with physics, same as maths in your area of trading, whatever, the, it works in a world of 
probabilistic outcomes. The outcomes are normally based on a law or a set of rules. In quantum, they go away. It's non-probabilistic computing, which means it looks at, think of it this way also, Newton's law of gravity, okay? Apple falls from a tree, so they work out a height, the mass of the apple, and then you get the velocity and it hits the ground. But in quantum, they will ask the question, was it windy that day? Was the tree on a hill? Did the apple bounce and then roll down the hill a bit? So it takes in all these other probabilities, yeah. Um, and, and that's more powerful because the world around us is around particles, vibrations, waves, and we can't understand them. We think we know a bit. So, so think about you know using these um, enormously powerful computers to work out how chemical interactions of drugs that we have today can start solving some of the big problems. So, for example, there's a protein they've identified called the FLAP protein that causes Alzheimer's. Now. But it's, it's the, the, the chemical equations and the chemical reactions and the compounds are just so vast that they can't process them. So with a quantum computer, you know, you can find the answers in, in seconds rather than millions of years. It's, that's the degree of advancement you're talking about. So therefore, you know, um, cures, uh, drugs, um, treatments um, that are massively, you know, how to create um, resistant uh, and fast-growing products for for feeding the people uh, we're running out of water we're running out of food so all of these challenges and all this is the this is this is really the fourth wealth creation generation that's happening first it was sort of steam then it was electricity then it was transistors miniaturizing and now we have quantum which is a massive your questions bang on because it's a massive wealth creation opportunity as you can solve the tougher problems therefore you'll create new product services and, and ways of monetizing that for, for the good of the people. It, look, when we, when, I've been an investor since I was 16 uh, and I've been a trader for the last 13 years. Uh, I'm 35. I know I look in my mid-20s, but I'm actually 35. Uh, I'm a trader. I've got no hair. You can see that. Yeah, yeah, I hear the jokes. Leave them out of the comments. I don't care. All right? I'm happy in who I am. But my question is this, right? So how does the everyday person like myself um, know what to invest in with quantum? Because it's, it's kind of like quantum computing is kind of like what blockchain is as well uh, and still is. Uh, it's a buzzword. It's a sales word. It's a word that um, brings in anticipation. It, it brings in potential. It, it excites people. So how do, we, how do you find out? And I guess this is the $6 million question, but how, how do you find out like what's a good quantum computing business is it about the solutions they're trying to create like how do you work that out how do we as general normal people try and get access to understand and then go forward and invest in what is by what you're saying and, and what just seems completely logical and obvious as the next major step forward for civilization really well look let's 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 think of every technology rollout what what that looks like so let's look at the personal computer revolution that i was involved in in 8081 so i got involved in personal computers um i was previously involved in the mainframe world um and when that personal computer revolution came out it put computing on the desktop but what did they need you needed the hardware clearly you know keyboard screen bit of memory hard drive um then you needed an operating system and then you can build applications on top of that. And that's where quantum is today. Right. You have hardware manufacturers, so you've got IBM Q, which is a 53 qubit machine at the moment, so it's pretty powerful. Google announced the 73 qubit uh, machine this week, um, and, and they're making hardware. There are other companies like Cambridge Quantum Computing that make the operating system, and there's a, a number of different operating systems and languages mm -hmm. that are already out there. There's a whole ecosystem. So we have the hardware, we have the, the operating system, and now we have the languages where we can create the apps. So, so it's, it's identical in a way of, of, of the way we would normally do things, but the opportunity is to get in early. Now, it's tough to get in to quantum uh, investments because governments are piling in, all the agencies. So some of these companies are owned by MI6, GCHQ, NSA, Lockheed Martin, all the big defense boys, because yeah. they know it's a breakthrough. Mm. So it really is a race because there is a belief that China could be ahead. 
Yep. Um, and if and if they get ahead, of course, the consequences of using it for AI and unlocking encryption and, uh, could be quite interesting. Mm. So there's a massive race. In the UK, the British government, I mean, you can criticize them on a lot of things, but they've already put 1.2 billion into quantum computing. Uh, and our local university here, they've given them a grant of 94 million to to advance quantum. So it's happening, wow. right? Again, there are lots of ways to invest in the application or the operating levels company, you know, or what have you. So, and and the returns and valuations are going through the roof. And we're putting quite a lot of our families into these kinds of deep tech, leading edge AI quantum opportunities. And they're all starting to raise a lot of capital. Um, and there's four or five different approaches of quantum, of course. You've got superconductors, trapped ions, you know, you've got photon approach and, and other approaches. There's no single path to, 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 to creating a quantum computer because it's all about using these little particles to do your, your calculations for you. So, yeah, good, good, good area to invest in. It's early. Uh, returns and multiples are, are doing really well. And uh, there's a lot to choose, but most of these companies are in stealth. You right. know, they're in stealth mode. They're difficult to identify. Yep. Uh, but if you search quantum computing or quantum operating systems, you'll get a list of maybe tw 20 companies out there. Not all are US, quite a big mix internationally. To the PRC? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, lots, there's lots to choose from. And then, and then you can have a little dabble. But in your world of trading of, and computing, you know, in, in financial analysis and stock market analysis and trending you know, same as weather patterns, the, the enablement of this massively powerful computing to, 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 to help you guys in your industry was, is going to be profound. Oh, absolutely. And look, I want to segue there. Thank you for that explanation because a lot of the questions that I ask are not just for the audience, they're for me. I'm, I'm, I'm in a wonderful position. I get to speak with amazing people and learn from them directly. So thank you for that explanation. I will be looking into that. You said a lot of your family. Now, I want to touch on that. Um, before we sort of wrap with the CC forum, what you will be speaking about at that forum in a couple of weeks time or next week, I think it might be. Anyway, so you talk about the family. So we had a little pre-conversation prior to pressing record on this interview. Now I understand that you put on events and you're very connected with a lot of different family offices. Do you want to tell us a little bit about you know, your involvement in the family office space and also where, where they are investing and how the whole family office which obviously for those that are very new to understanding what that means it's it's families that are trying to grow their wealth maintain their wealth and they're usually on the cutting edge of certain things even though it's just a very small percentage of their portfolio they're looking to maintain that family's uh position financially uh, in the world so what are you doing with them how is their investing changing and where are they really focused on at the moment well that, that's another good question and there is there is uh, quite a bit in there so so if you think about um you know the super rich ultra high net worths yeah. the families you know they, they, their trend line used to be um uh that they would put their capital into funds or funder funds or vc models lock their capital up for five to ten years yeah. and trust other people to invest their money um at the moment that's that's changing You've got a new generation of families arriving, you know, youngsters who are tech savvy and, and they want to direct invest. So there's been a massive sea change. So, so what do families uh, invest in? Well, most families sit, already sit on quite a lot of assets, normally land and property, which is the cornerstone of their portfolio. But in the last few years, we've seen a, a dramatic shift towards tech, tech investing mainly because of the multiples, but also because they're looking for value and flexibility. So if you think about where families are, you know, they put their capital into funder funds and they're locked in for five or 10 years. Or they start investing in things like digital assets, which, are, which enable once illiquid assets maybe to create more liquidity. And then they can get in a, in, into a position and get out of a position. And, and th that's a sea change. What are they investing in? Well, they, families invest in three ways and, and from multiple sources. Quite a lot of the families will have their own personal capital. They'll put it in a family trust structure or they'll own a number of companies that also deploy capital. So it's not a one trick pony. Yep. A lot of families, so let's say you and I were, were run a family office, we'd have our passion projects, wouldn't we? So we would have projects that are important to us because mm -hmm. a lot of wealthy people are riddled with the need 
a little bit of guilt in there maybe that they are privileged and done well, but they want to give back. So passion projects might be, you know, um, saving animal cruelty or it might be, you know, whatever it is. But there's other passion projects that, you know, we might have. It might be cars or collecting cars or fixing it, you know, whatever it is. And then you have the safe money projects. And these are projects where they will invest in because they are solid, low risk, uh, known and then the third type of investing they're doing at the moment is more speculative. And that's really around deep tech. So people say to me, oh, I've got this great you know, electric vehicle uh, project or this great solar project. You know, can you put it in front of the families? And the answer is no, because the family's not interested because electric vehicles are not biodegradable, they're, they're harmful for the planet, and, and you need fossil fuels to, to charge the battery. They're getting there. I'm a fan of Elon's as well, as well but the families will see that as not not now if you then said what about solar well solar is also quite old technology and and the electrolyte um fluid you need to store the charge is again quite harmful for the planet and again solar panels not biodegradable and so on yeah. so so the families are better informed than us craig they get better mm-hmm. macro data they're well educated they have a global view so where are the fam? The families are investing in anything to do with water. Massive water shortages. Yeah. We're going to have a global migration of people because of that. Um, countries like China are struggling to feed all their people, same as India, yeah. because there's parts of their country that, you know, those are the things that they, they, and they also have speculation capital. So they like tech, they like blockchain, they like AI, smart cities. You know, we've got some very cool, cool projects that we introduced to the families. And we work directly with uh, about seven of France's biggest family, two Middle Eastern Abu Dhabi based families, a uh, couple of American families and a couple of European families out of Switzerland. Uh, we don't have a big enough team to work with anymore, but I'm plugged into probably a hundred plus others where they look at us and say, Nick, can you give us some deal flow? When you find a gem, let us know. Um, and we just have to keep track of what they're interested in, are they interested in entertainment or, or vegan products or, or whatever. It's, uh, you just have to navigate it. But that's the best source of capital. Um, yeah. In, in Especially if you've got the trust. I mean, it, it, people at that sort of level, it, it, business is done on trust uh, and logic is what I've understood from like, I've got some, maybe not as wealthy as that, but some friends in, in and around where I look out here. I'm, I'm, I look out straight from where my office is over Double Bay. And there's double base of very wealthy areas. I think it's got the highest uh, square meterage postcode in the country, how, yeah. housing price wise. And same thing, a lot of deals can be done very, very quickly if that trust is there. And it must be quite fascinating. Or sorry, it must be quite amazing to be in a position of yourselves right, where you are fed information that you get this higher echelon of understanding on a global scale. Of course, you've got your own theories and your own views and your own visions, but to uh, be able to tap into, I mean, family officers don't employ fools they tend to have the smartest of the smart they're happy to pay them and they're happy to make sure that they stick around and they're educated throughout the whole process as well so it must be a really interesting place to be involved in yeah look i mean the families spend a lot of their time a lot of families don't want to be visible Mm. uh, because you know there's the tax man sitting there as well um and and also the worried about other other people out there um uh but the ones that are visible um you know, they don't like being sold to, generally. Um, and and that's the biggest mistake. We, for some of these summits that we, we sponsor these big global summits um, and we co-organize with the families, we often take a lot of projects along and the CEOs go immediately into pitch mode and we coach them and coach them and say, don't do this. Yeah. You know, you're dealing with individuals who are very clever, you know, please don't pitch them, but they can't help themselves. And the door closes. Uh, in fact, we know um, Australia's largest family as well, um, Minerals and Mining. So you probably know who that is. Um, I could guess. <laughs> and, and they are and they are incredibly nice people. They like a beer as well. Uh, and I introduced uh, a healthcare project to to them in Monaco um, about three or four months ago. Um, and and the CEO had a fantastic project, but he pitched them. And 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 the family guy, he's a very big, big, uh, laid back Aussie guy. He said he just walked off and went to the bar, you know. And and it was an opportunity missed because if if it, if the if the guy had spent time getting to know the family, and the first question was, you know, so what are you, what are you guys up to? What are you guys investing? What do you spend? Do it the other way around. Question them. Mm. Don't sell. And um, 
it's inevitable. People get dazzled in the headlights. They see somebody with loads of capital, and they and they forget all of their teachings. All their criticisms go, oh, came at once. But you know, as I say, it's about relationships first. Doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, it's taken me, it's taken us, well, for the U Middle Eastern families, it takes us seven or eight meetings before you get a chance to meet the sheikhs. Yeah. So you have to go through that hierarchy. Um, and and for some of the, the, the European families, you know, you have to go and meet the families at their, at their residences mm. and spend time with them. And they want to see your face. And I, up until this year, I hadn't asked families for any favours. You know, only now do I know them well enough to say, oh, you might want to have a look at this one because it's, it's a real gem, we think. And it's, uh, it's a game changer. And when you get to that level, that's when... We, I think we've probably had about two, three hundred million of capital deployed this year on some of our projects. Um, and the ones that attracted the attention were virtual reality mm -hmm. in the fashion industry. Uh, and the other one that attracted a lot of uh, attention was litigation finance. Um, to support the mis-selling of, of products like mortgages and pensions. Like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a tough one, Craig. Um, money's there. Families are very difficult to reach, very difficult to get at. Uh, the barrier to entry is you've nailed it. You, you've got to spend time getting to know them. And, and that means going to where they are. And it's often quite expensive to go where they are. You know? yeah. <laughs> I hear you, mate. I hear you. They, they, they tend to live in nice parts of the world. And uh, yes, uh, uh, very far flung areas as well. Now, finally, you're going to be at the CC Forum, which is a spectacular looking event uh, in London. I interviewed Max uh, uh, very recently. Uh, I'll be there as well. I'm going to be speaking. I've got a keynote slot and we've got a stall there. Uh, and we're actually running a course the day before uh, to teach people a few of the strategies that we actually employ on a day-to-day -day basis. But I mean, yeah. what are you going to be covering at the CC? For, by the way, it's the 13th to the 16th. Uh, of October, so a couple of weeks away, um, literally a couple of weeks away. What, what are you talking to there? Like, what, what's going to be, what are you bringing to the event as a presenter, as somebody who's involved in, um, in informing others of opportunity? Well, I, 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 I always get conflicted when these events, because um, I, could, I could cover a number of different topics. Mm. Um, but generally speaking, um, I, I, I was going to talk about the fourth wealth creation revolution, which is, you know, it's just arrived in the station and how are you are going to take advantage of it? And it's this thing called quantum and AI and machine, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's going to open up, as we touched on earlier, loads of opportunities and redefine industries and redefine the ability to solve problems. Yeah. But I also might just do 21 million. Um, because by that time, the trailer will be out of a can. I'll have a sizzle Do that. Wheel. Do that. <laughs> and I, yeah, and I might just put it on the stage because we, you know, and, and, and that really is the manifestation of a, of a two-year journey of an ICO project, one of the very few that actually is delivered Doing something. on its promises. So, again, that might be a good statement to make. Um, and, um, you know, I think there's a few people in the industry that sort of... Uh, you know, as we said earlier, the doubters, the haters, whatever. But, you know, that might shut them up, which is, would be quite good. Um, look, I met Max um, when it was a dream. You know, I met him in Dubai at the AIM Congress when I was doing a keynote there. And, and Max said to me, he said, look, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a conference. What do you think? And I, my immediate thought was, you're taking on something enormously challenging. Yeah. Uh, and I spoke in London last year, and it was obviously the first one, and... You know, we're a little bit down on, on numbers, maybe. Um, but he pulled it off, and it was a quality event. Very good. What you'll find with Max's event um, is high production quality. Yeah, okay. um, It's really good. Uh, he's got some really good speakers. Oh, um, yeah, it's amazing. The I think the audience well. will be very appreciative this year. And uh, Max is one of the good guys. I mean, I, you know, I, I, he's one of the good guys, and we need to help him. Oh, look, well. I'm, I'm absolutely, everything you've said, I agree with that the list of speakers is phenomenal. Uh, the booths, the way he's got them set out, like we've got one there. It, it, he's one of the, um, you could put him back in 1888 and he'd still fit in. You know, he's just such yeah. an English gentleman. One of the last yeah. ones remaining. He is an English rose, yeah. a fantastic human. And those of you, when you listen to this, you'll have already heard the Nick interview. You'll understand, you know, um, sorry, the Max interview. You'll, you'll understand what I'm saying, that the man is a, he's a, uh, he's the personification of an English gentleman. Um, so yeah. uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are around that area, if you're in Europe and look, there's no excuse, by the way, if you say, oh, I live over here in Spain. I'm like, come on, I know how cheap flights are in Europe. Don't, yeah. don't make that as an excuse. Get your ass on a plane, 
Fly to London, 13th to the 16th. Tickets aren't over the top either. It's not like consensus where it's really, really wildly expensive. Get yourself along. Come have a beer with me. Shake my hand. Listen to some of the talks. Uh, meet Nick here. Listen to the keynote speeches and, and really get yourself immersed in what I think could be a very powerful event based on the, the star-studded list of speakers. And Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to uh, getting to know you a little bit, taking half an hour or so of your time. I've, I've really enjoyed speaking with you, a number of topics that I was not aware of. I do like to understand what's the next frontier. I do love to talk about what family and offices are into because they are at the forefront and they tend to, they don't get everything right, but they tend to be the first finger on the pulse as soon as a pulse has begun. And it sounds like quantum is something I need to look into a heck of a lot more. Max, oh, sorry, on. between Max and Nick. Nick, where do we find out more information about what you're doing and plug into you and then any additional information you can provide the audience? Yeah, well, I'm, uh, I do do a lot of writing. So, you know, I've got a, a fairly big social media following. Um, you can read my articles on Medium. I write about a whole range of different things. Uh, I'm working on a, on a book, which is um, the, 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 the subject matter is why decentralized operating models always outperform centralized models. So that's, that's, that will be out probably beginning of the new year. I'm going to self-publish that because publishers take too long. Mm. Um, we have, we have our, obviously our chain startup business all has web presences, but we have uh, Crix.io, C-R-I-X.io. That's our crypto trading exchange with our Al Algo trading platform. That's a lot of fun. There's a sandbox on there you can play with, uh, creating your own strategies and see how they deploy. So you, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty visible on social media. Um, 21 million TV.com is, is the website. If you want to find it, so you can see the cast and crew, we'll tell you about the launch date. Um, and, and at CC London, you never know. I might bring a, a sneaky preview with me and, uh, talk about that. But, uh, thanks very much, Craig. Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I look forward to having a beer with you in London, chatting and uh, getting to know you a little bit more. Uh, I really have enjoyed this, mate. So thank you so much for your time. I've gone over the time, but you know what? Sometimes, you know what? We're allowed to because this went into some very, very important topics. So again, I just thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for your time. Have a fantastic day and I shall see you in London. You will. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, bye for now. London, listen up. We will be with you taking our checklist-based trading strategies on the back of the CC Forum, October 12 at the Queen Elizabeth Conference Center. If you want to learn these checklist-based trading strategies that I've been employing for quite some time and you want to learn it in person, get yourself booked now. We have thousands of people at the CC Forum and the event will sell out quickly. From there, we move on to Malta on the 9th of November. That'll be at the Intercontinental Hotel in Malta, also backing on to the back of an event, which is Malta AI and Blockchain Summit. Again, thousands of people expected to so get your spot quickly from Malta straight across the pond to Singapore. November 16 at Marina Bay Sands, another event we are tacking on to the end of, which is called Block Show. Again, this has got thousands of people, so if you want to come along, get in there quick. And finally, back in Sydney on the 23rd and 24th at the Ridges World Square. So guys, whether it be London, Malta, Singapore, you need to get yourself along to these events if you want to learn the checklist-based trading that I employ and use daily. Very simple stuff, guys. Go to tradercob.com forward slash global and book your spot right now.